Crusader Kings is one of my favourite game series of all time. And for many reasons, the mix of grand strategy with RPG-like characters, giving you the ability to tell a story among all the chaos, is the perfect combination to take both genres that one step further. And whether you started with the original Crusader Kings or just started with number three, I think we can all appreciate just how far the game has come over the years to bring us all hundreds and if not thousands of hours worth of frustration, silly moments and most importantly, fun. Now I do imagine most people didn't start all the way back in 2004. So today I went back in time, trying the original for the first time and even the very first version 1.0 of Crusader Kings 2. And the biggest shock for me was just how the very first version of CK2 is nothing like what the game become. But of course, first, Crusader Kings complete. Europe has emerged from the Dark Ages. Now its people seek to make their mark in history. Paradox Interactive released the original Crusader Kings all the way back in April of 2004. It was met with fairly average reviews at the time with PC Gamer stating, a cool new twist on a grand strategy hampered by technical problems. And everywhere you look online you can see the constant complaints at the state of the game. At this point though, there was already two games out of the Europa Universalis series we all know and love today. But Crusader Kings stood out due to the extra focus on each character's life, their personalities, making sure they have an heir to take on all their titles after death and who you would assign to help manage your realm or possibly just focusing on arranging the perfect marriage to get a super strong alliance although today crusader kings complete may not be up to today's standards this game brought many people into the world of grand strategy and just allowed so many people's imagination to run wild as they built the ultimate dynasty in medieval europe and due to the fact that it actually used the Europa Universalis game engine, you could still even all the way back then continue your save file from CK1 to EU2, which is mad. I didn't think that would be possible all the way back then like it is now, but it's cool to actually see it was. Now, it did have three start dates. So the first, 1066 with Hastings, then the Third Crusade in 1187, and then the Hundred Years' War, of course, between England and France in 1337. And in this game, basically, the lowest available level is counties, so there's no extra domains where you'd see your barons and bishops ruling their part of the world. Although you could still actually appoint your court members, just like you see in the later titles. Although characters only had skills in martial, stewardship, intrigue, and diplomacy. So there was no learning back then. Now you will notice there's a treasury screen where you could adjust the amount of taxes from different sources. Although pushing it too far would result in your loyalty drop in, causing your vassals to stand up against you and start a war. Or you could even just save money by low in your army maintenance at the cost of the silent killer attrition. But these of course ain't massively in depth, they're just some simple sliders for you to manage. There's also some laws like your title succession to laws that once again affect how different classes of people will like you. And as well as all that there's advances you can focus on to improve your income or directly improve your armies. And what's so nice about it in this game is that you can actually see what kingdoms have what tech unlock. I really just went into the game thinking it would be absolutely terrible and although not the best looking I really like how just colourful they made the game but I must be honest the controls for the game are so awkward to use like you want to pause the game yeah click pause break like what arrow keys to pan around the map you know good old-fashioned 2004 plus it did have a fairly limited map compared to what we're all used to these days mainly just featuring Europe but it really did set the foundation for future games to grow and this can really be seen inside of Crusader Kings 2 especially the release version of Crusader Kings 2. Just so many features were expanded on, adding so much more depth to the game, as well as many more brand new features. Especially if you mention the however many DLCs, but honestly, I'd argue there's a bigger difference from the very first version 
to the last version of CK2 than there actually is from the original Crusader Kings to CK2. Probably the biggest difference at launch was the map has clearly been expanded, but you can just instantly see the menus look and act so similar to CK1. They're pretty awkward, like interacting with other characters isn't just a simple right click. You either have to go into the diplomacy tab and then click on the realm, you have to click on the character and then click on the diplomacy tab. And this just really goes to show the amount of effort Paradox put into Crusader Kings 2 during its life. They really just stuck by the game and made some massive updates for it. And I'd guess the majority of you, as well as myself, first played this game out of the series. Now, the DLCs eventually added new start dates as far back as 769 AD, as well as massive features like the much-loved societies where you could join different ones and do a wide range of different missions for them to increase your rank in the society and unlock new abilities. As well as all the great new features that was added, it did use a newer engine, the Klauswitz engine, which allowed for 3D objects and it really made a big difference difference to the world map, letting you see all the mountains and each town clearly on the map, which played a fairly big part in now finally having barons on each county, as each one had more than one holding, adding even more depth to manage in your realm. Honestly, I'm glad I never picked up CK2 on its original release date. It just seemed so painful to actually play and... We're honestly so lucky the series has come leaps and bounds since then. What really kept the game alive though was the modding community. It exploded with some insane mods, like the incredibly detailed A Game of Thrones mod, or the Elder Kings bringing you into the world of the Elder Scrolls. And even things like After the End add in post-apocalyptic North America. I know for many people, mods like this really just cemented the game as one of your favourites. And this time it got a review score of 82 by the critics and 8.7 from the players. The game really was loved and it's still loved to this date with many people just still playing it due to the abundance of content that can actually only be found here. Plus, at the time, no other games really give you such a detailed game, allowing you to get involved in medieval European politics, while at the same time plotting to kill the Pope just because. All of this just really let you play a new story with each character. Sometimes you could play as a cannibal wrecking havoc, joining the demon worshippers, and his son might be the ultimate man of God. You also got to appoint each council member to take on different tasks to help your realm, and assign many minor titles to those in your court. A completely overhaul technology tab where you would send your spy master to go and study technology. Let's be honest though, it was usually in Constantinople. Just hoping they don't get captured and thrown in prison. And the many, many decisions that ended up in the game just added so much value. And it just really helped you fully roleplay as your character. There's just so many reasons why loads of people still play this game from 2012 and 2021. Then, of course, came Crusader Kings 3. What a fool. Blinded by his desire for revenge, my husband threw himself at the mighty walls of our enemies. It reached an all-time high for the series on Metacritic, having a score of 91 and a user score of 8.4 and for a very good reason. The game had a complete visual overhaul and the UI made the game so much more accessible for new people to the series and it's just way more intuitive. Plus the addition of 3D portraits just adds so much more to getting immersed into the world. Instead of just seeing a face, you actually get to see characters while events happen. And if you look at modders like Castox, they really are pushing the 3D characters to the limit with archery, fishing, and even videos of 3D battles. So hopefully Paradox are working on something similar after the Royal Court, maybe. Now, I have seen many people complain about the lack of content in CK3 versus 2. And yeah, they're fully correct. Although if you do play CK2 with no DLCs on the release version, then you have to agree, Paradox definitely made a better template this time for the wave of new content that will eventually come to the game. Personally, I'm not saying this really lacking too much content. I still find it incredibly fun. The map just looks great. Your characters now have lifestyle trees. It's more similar to what you'd actually find in an RPG game allowing for each character to actually feel different than those before them. As well as earning renown for your family to eventually unlock additions to the whole dynasty. 
overall, though, I think Crusader Kings 3 is going to lean a lot more into the characters, which I think is something I'm glad of. The characters and stuff is what really makes Crusader Kings stand out from any other grand strategy game. Uh, but I would love to hear all your thoughts on all these games. What's your favorite? Have you ever tried the original? Anything like that, be sure to let me know in the comments. But anyway, I'm going to end the video with a massive thank you to all the channel members. We have Bayek von Quark, Arcane, Damian, Intimia1, Irrelevant, Luke Jarrett, and Zigadelic. But yeah, thank you all so much for watching, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.